Were you guys totally shocked by how many people were stunned at seeing a fish out of the water get medical care? And so what our team was able to do was put it between foam in a plastic like Rubbermaid container. So when I saw that post, I was immediately just invested. <laughs> I had to look at every picture going on with that. I was like, you never see this side of anything going on with that. Builders crew, we're here in Denver, Colorado at the Denver Zoo with Jessica, and we are here at a very specific location inside of the zoo. Tell us about it. So this is our Tropical Discovery Building. This building was built in 1993, so it's a 30-year-old building, and in here we have most of the zoo's biodiversity. So oh, wow. we have an incredible amount of amphibians and reptiles and fish and invertebrates and some mammals that are all housed within this building. Well, the animal we're most interested in today is our French angelfish. Yes. He's one of our inhabitants here. And that animal has been here since 2016. Okay. And so we're going to go in and check it all out. All right. Well, let's go. Let's go see what Jessica has to show us. What exactly happened with this little guy or gal? Yeah, so this French angel presented with some buoyancy issues and our animal care specialist, Jake, pulled it off exhibit. And when that happened, we alerted our veterinary team at the Helen and Arthur E. Johnson Hospital and we set up an exam. And so at that point, to transfer an animal across the zoo required a cart, a bin, oxygen, all of our equipment to go. If we walk it, it's about a 10 minute walk. And so we needed to move that animal a little more quickly. This happened in June. And so I know the article was released fairly recently on our social media. And this animal is already obviously back in exhibit and doing fabulously. When we get to the hospital, we were able to sedate this animal in MS-222 in a small known volume of water, just so that it wouldn't hurt itself or thrash. And we were able to handle it and do an ultrasound. When the ultrasound showed inflammation and a little bit it kind of showed like a mass on the side and so we ran it through our CT machine and so the CT machine is a little bit more difficult with some of our aquatic friends we right. normally send dry air breathing animals through there and so what our team was able to do was put it between foam in a plastic like Rubbermaid container so that we could run water over it between the images the entire CT process takes about 10 seconds to go through and then back. And so in that process, we made sure to keep the gills wet, keep the skin wet so that it can still breathe because this animal was asleep. Right. And so we wanna make sure that it's stable, still able to breathe. The images that everybody got to see, which are incredible and amazing, are not instantaneous. And so after that exam, we removed the fish, we put it back into water that was free of MS-222 to allow it to recover and brought it back to the hospital, uh, from the hospital back down to Tropical Discovery. Our veterinary team was able to use those images and determine that this animal had severe enteritis, so inflammation of its intestines that created a buildup of gas. And so this fish came back down here and went on some oral metronidazole and then transitioned to um, intramuscular enrofloxacin or Batril. And that, that helped this animal resolve entirely in a few weeks. So he, he or she went up to the hospital in June and was better and back on exhibit in July. So you had to do some diet changes, I'm assuming, just a little tweak here and yeah, there? Yeah, so we made sure we're, we're getting this animal some extra fiber, um, some extra vegetables, and just making sure that we're helping keep that inflammation down. Um, many of our animals would prefer to eat the less healthy oh, options course. presented. Yeah. I mean, I would too. I, I like candy. I Candy's like it too. Good. And so we're making sure that they're getting nori and vegetables and gel in addition to some of those seafood mixes and so we have a nutritionist on staff that helps 
make sure all of our formulations are appropriate for the natural histories of our animals. And so luckily these guys utterly love eating like peas and green beans and lettuce and nori. And so that just helps provide a little more roughage. Right kind of keep that inflammation down and not have a buildup of gas. Our animal care specialists across the entire zoo do daily observations on all of our animals. We check everything multiple times a day. We do welfare assessments quarterly on just about everything in the building. Um, it's a little harder with some of our mixed groups of animals where you have hundreds of animals in or you one have certain lots zone. of cockroaches yeah. in an exhibit. Or, and the, so that makes it difficult. But anything that is easily identifiable as an individual can easily have an individual welfare assessment. And if that doesn't work, we can do an environment or an exhibit assessment. Do all of our occupants. Mm -hmm. Are they healthy? Are they thriving? Are they displaying natural behaviors? Are they eating appropriately? Have there been any water quality parameters that would cause distress or problems? And so we're able to do that in a formal way. So when I saw that post, I was immediately just invested. <laughs> I had to look at every picture going on with that. I was like, this is so cool. You never see this side of anything going on with that. And there's so many people even in the hobby that may not even know that there is such a thing as a fish veterinarian. I think the traditional route for many veterinarians is dogs, cats, pigs, horses. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be those large mammals. So exotic veterinarians are then dealing with things that are tigers and otters and lions. And even birds. Even birds. Even, even, birds. Yeah, even lizards, birds. Lizards, maybe yeah. large lizards, large snakes. The aquatic one is, a, is very specific, very kind of focused. And so I think it takes incredible veterinary teams to be able to work with the diversity of taxa. Whenever you do get it back here, mm -hmm. they're getting their medications. Yeah. And now you are ready to decide, okay, you can go back on exhibit. Mm -hmm. What is that process like? So that process would be very similar to anybody who is moving an animal from their quarantine to a main exhibit or to their, their home aquarium or to a large body of water, we're going to acclimate them. So we're gonna make sure that we have appropriate water quality parameters. Uh, luckily, just about everything in Tropical Discovery that's salt water is kept very similarly. So that process doesn't have to be long, but we're gonna make sure that we check the temperature, the pH, the ammonia, the nitrites, nitrates. We're gonna match that and acclimate them and then we're able to reintroduce. So this individual is doing great. We have been able to just keep our observations daily on this animal. We're able to watch what's going on. The body condition looks great. Our animal care specialist, Jake, is able to, you know, communicate anything that would be abnormal and unusual and say, I'm watching it, or, you know, let's have the vets look at it in general for our collection. So it's no different for this animal. So whenever you guys posted this on social media, I saw it, so many other people saw it. I had so many friends that were actually resharing it and seeing it everywhere. What was that like? Were you guys totally shocked by how many people were stunned at seeing a fish out of the water get medical care that we're used to seeing us get or even bigger animals get? I think we were incredibly surprised and shocked and also pleasantly surprised about the outpouring of interest oh, yeah. in this because it is, it's part of our job to help inspire communities to save wildlife for future generations. And it's part of our job to bridge that gap between hobbyists and professionals. And there's so much to learn from each other. And I just loved that the interest was so large. Ironically, it came out the same time we had a baby orangutan post. Oh, really? And in the first couple of days, the fish outdid the orangutan post. So that we were all amazing. secretly very excited that our fish was way cooler right. than a primate. Right, because primates, whenever you yeah. know babies are born, babies. It's, it's it's really a big deal. Mm -hmm. So because this little guy or gal was not feeling well, do you guys do any type of preventative treatments in the system where it came from? Or you just kind of monitor everybody because it was such a unique circumstance for this For guy. this circumstance, we're just monitoring. So we're not gonna treat anything prophylactically because this wasn't cryptocarrion. This wasn't um, like anything that was transferable to other fish. So there would be no reason to, to add medication to mm -hmm. our system. This isn't a reef. Right. So we're lucky that we wouldn't be worrying about that, but there's no reason to add that stress to our other animals if they're not displaying anything, or if we were to catch them up and do a skin scrape or a gill clip, do they have anything? Mm -hmm. So we would rather not add medication unnecessarily. We don't want to create antibiotic resistance. Right, do not do that. No. <laughs> be very mindful of all medications that you guys put in yes. your tank. So. Okay, Reef Builders crew, I want to give a very special thank you to Jessica for having us out here at the Denver Zoo. This was an incredible story and I hope you guys enjoyed it.